Our next panel is the workforce development. I think it's one area that there's no uh, debate why we need to do it. And I'm uh, glad to introduce our panelist, uh, Arvind Ratham, a Chief Strategy and Revenue Officer from Q Control, uh, Mike Kamer from uh, Quantum Computing Inc., uh, Lamont Silvis, just in time, Head of Government Solutions for IMQ, and, and Tim Gilday, uh, Emerging Tech uh, from uh, GDIT. Thank you very much. That was really perfect timing. So first, I want to thank everybody for taking the time to be here. I know people didn't just come from out of state. They came from out of country to be here. We have a very high density of thought leaders, geniuses, um, people that are trying to make connections both in commercial and government industry. Today, we're very fortunate to have some great representation from industry. And we're talking about one of the most important uh, pieces or components of the quantum umbrella, and that's the workforce itself, the development and the talent pool understanding this dynamic area, what types of talent we need, um, how to build it the right way at the right speed to keep pace with technology and not have too much on the bench, keep optimized. That's what we're trying to uh, pull out of our great panelists today. So as usual, start you off with a joke to uh, break the ice. And if you get this answer, I'm, I'm sure you'll know this before I finish the joke, but Heisenberg was pulled over by a police officer who was enraged and yelled at him, do you know how fast you're going? What do you think he said? No, but I know exactly where I am. <laughs> All right, some of you physicists got that, thank you. All right, so without further ado, we've got some great speakers here. I'm gonna hand it over to each of you to give a brief background about yourself, and I'm gonna ask you also, could you give something that is maybe the favorite part of your job or a highlight of your day-to-day -day job? So again, I'm Tim Gilday from GDIT. I'm gonna hand it over to Mike Keemer. Hi, thanks for uh, having me. My name is Mike Keemer. I'm with Quantum Computing, Inc. We're a uh, producer of photonic hardware focused on uh, nonlinear quantum optics. And uh, we work across all three pillars of uh, computing, sensing, and cybersecurity. Uh, historically, I've been able to focus on really customer applications. So that means that the solutions team that I've been a part of, we're kind of like that proverbial kid in the quantum candy store. We have all kinds of really talented people who are building and inventing new quantum technologies, and they drop them into our hands to play with first. So that's really the most fun part of the job. Uh, my name is Arvind. I run strategy uh, and revenue at uh, Q Control. Um, Q Control is known. We're, we're a Sydney-based company, about 140 employees, um, offices in Berlin, UK, with Santa Monica, and in Sydney. Uh, our headquarters. Uh, we are best known for our uh, error suppression software, uh, uh, quickly becoming ubiquitous across the industry. But in parallel, we've got a fairly major quantum sensing program uh, that's going, and we're supplying to the Australian Navy and a whole bunch of other players. But in parallel, uh, many years ago, we realized that uh, we had to make an investment in workforce development. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's seen great success and I'm happy to talk about it. In terms of what excites me, uh, it's, uh, you know, we, uh, more, more than 60% of the company has, has PhDs and uh, we do some world-class research, but seeing that research translate into product and into revenue, right in front of me, I'm talking quarters, not years, is, it has been extremely gratifying, so I, I just love working here. I'll pass on to one of our first customers, IonQ. <laughs> Thanks, Arvind. Hi, I'm Lamont Silvis. I'm head of government solutions for IonQ. Been with the company a little over two years. Uh, my experience in quantum goes back to late 2016 uh, when I was asked by a, a career mentor to take a look at, at, uh, at a quantum startup, not IonQ, uh, and got involved in it first by starting with, now what are these things used for? And that led me to this, and it's been a tremendous journey over the years of watching the industry develop, watching the hardware, the software, the algorithms, and more importantly, watching the people develop alongside that, right? Because at the end of the day, um, I've got a really cool quantum chip here in my pocket that I'll show you in a minute, but it's not about the chips, it's about the people. That's what makes this all possible. So I'm, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to be here today with my colleagues to talk about what we're doing and explore with all of you, I hope, where we go next. Because the next ideas, uh, we, don't, we don't own all of those ideas, you do. And so together, let's, let's find what the future looks like. You know, if you can build a quantum computer, I guess we can figure out how to use one microphone. Maybe put it in superposition here. 
So uh, I had some great conversation. I get trapped walking around the floor. It goes from the technical to the philosophical. And a pretty eye-opening conversation started, uh, hey, we've got plenty of engineers. Just give me technicians. So the workforce is actually not just a bunch of quantum physicists. It's much broader than that. And I can barely you know, scratch the tip of the iceberg. Could each of you start uh, by telling me some of the other roles that we need in the quantum workforce? And then why is, why is the workforce important in this quantum upcoming quantum revolution? And we'll start with Lamont. We'll go in reverse. Thanks, Tim. So what Tim was saying is so true, right? Um, everyone thinks about quantum physicists, and no doubt, super important for the development of this industry and what happens next, but also important, critical even, are the roles of technicians, right? We need a whole range of skill sets. When IonQ was first spun out from the University of Maryland, uh, obviously we hired a lot of quantum physicists. We hired almost exclusively quantum physicists. But as we've commercialized the technology, and developed it, we moved from hiring physicists to hiring uh, engineers, right? Software engineers, product engineers, people who could help develop the, the hardware to go with the ideas and the physics, to enable the physics work that had been done. Now, as we're building hardware, building computers, and delivering them for our customers, what's next? Well, maintenance, right? You're not going to maintain a quantum computer with a physicist, you need people who can swap out the lasers, for example. You need people who can assemble these machines when they arrive on premises at a customer site, who can put it together, configure it, commission it, and then maintain it over the long term to make sure that people continue to get real value from them. Yeah, I, uh, to answer this question, I'm going to use a framework that uh, came out of the White House in a QIST report that uh, they put out recently. Think of the whole quantum workforce as a pyramid, right? The experts, that are the people who are, ex who are eminent, well-known in this field, really are at the top of the pyramid, and there's not that many of them, right? The level below uh, are those who need to be QIST or quantum, let's call it as quantum proficient. And these could be like photonics engineers, application architects, so on and so forth. There's more of them than the true researchers. And then below that, you've got people who need to be quantum aware. And those are software developer, data scientists, technical sales, right? You need to be, you need to know enough about your quantum computer to be able to sell a computer, for example, right? And that still requires a certain amount of knowledge. Uh, and then at the bottom, you've got your general STEM professional, right? Circuit designers, uh, you know, machine learning engineers, people who just need to uh, know, know just the bare minimum that they need to be able to do their job. So there is a, there's a role that work workforce development plays in each, each of these layers, right? One, so as you get towards the bottom of the pyramid, there's going to be more jobs. But as you go towards the top of the pyramid, there's more expertise. So a, a workforce development program needs to be able to cater to everyone in this pyramid. Yeah, when, when I think about this, I think of it differently across each of the three pillars, really, that the way that people are going to be interacting with uh, quantum sensing and quantum networking is different than the way they're going to be interacting with quantum computing. With quantum computing, the end user has all kinds of ability to customize the application that they're doing. They're programming down to the gates, right? Where with networking and sensing, it's going to be uh, a little bit different. Um, so on, on that front, if, if I'm thinking about you know, the areas where we as an industry can do the most for workforce development, um, I'd focus a lot, we want to focus a lot more attention on that product, uh, product engineering layer, which is really just jumping a lot on, on connecting to what the last panel was saying at the end. If, if we're going to be investing money in the workforce to try and build up the skill sets for people to be able to use these technologies, an alternative strategy of investing instead in the productization to drive down the barriers and make it more accessible gets you a multiple of uh, accessibility on, the, on that dollar. So I think that's an area where we as an industry need to be able to, to really focus from, uh, from a technology production standpoint. Perfect. There's a great uh, microphone passing there. So uh, we've got the, we kind of laid the landscape of the different types of roles and that you can cross train existing skill sets and, and get them up to speed in a new industry uh, without having to start from scratch. That's important, but how would you best roll this out? Because most technologies, emerging technologies, follow this hype cycle, this peak of inflated expectations, and then the trough of disillusionment. Money flows sometimes too fast, and then we get too big. 
how do we prevent necessarily uh, overcompensating and getting too many people while the technology might not be ready? And what's the best way to roll this out? Is it state incentives? Is it working with universities? Is it enterprises or private uh, companies training people? Arvind, since you helped to contribute these questions, I'm going to start with you. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, there are various models, and we serve all constituencies. I was, going to, I was saying earlier that uh, one of our first customers, uh, who was a hardware builder, uh, was IonQ, right? And uh, you know, they they had customers coming to them asking them uh, for uh, maybe pretty good education platform on how things work, and they wanted to train their own employees as well in Quantum 101, so to speak. Right, and then we've uh, so j j let me let me give a little bit of context. So in 2019 or so, we realized that we had to build a world class uh, a, a quantum education product, and this is because if you want to learn quantum today, you can go. You know, the, the experts will go read publications, and obviously, you need to be highly qualified to be able to make head or tail of them. The other end, you've got YouTube videos and such, and uh, you know the quality is all over the place, right? And it's largely influencers who have an important role to play in, in the area of inspiring uh, future generations of people. And there was nothing in the middle. So we, uh, we in fact, retained a world-class children's educator <clears throat> called Chris, Chris Ferry. He'd written a bunch of books for babies, right? science books for babies. And uh, so we were, you know, we, uh, our researchers spent a lot of time in laying out a, a curriculum and, and, and this person came in uh, with a unique uh, pedagogy and, 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 and uh, that was really concept driven and through 375 interactive simulations with, with explana associated explanations, took users through a journey where in 30 hours they start from scratch, by the time they're done with the product, they can, read, they can go on maybe IBM's website or IonQ's website and start programming a quantum computer. And this was a quantum 101 uh, type, type course. So now, in terms of the most efficient model to, to roll this out, I, I really think that I, I love the government-based uh, model. If you can influence state governments to, uh, in, um, to include quantum as a mandatory part of the curriculum, uh, you're going to get maximum reach. And uh, as I speak, uh, the NQCC, National Quantum Computing Center in the UK, has adopted our software product as standard. And uh, four states in India are running pilots. Uh, so as I speak, we have 20,000 users and, and growing really fast, potentially to millions, if the, the India model uh, takes off at scale. So, uh, But where I'm coming uh, to as, as the next part of the question is the, think through the, you know, you know, just play out the journey. Students get inspired through uh, through local news, YouTube channels, etc. They go through this learning journey, and then what's the first question they ask after they finish? Where is my quantum computer? How do I start experimenting with this quantum computer? And this uh, invokes a huge movement, a grassroots-led movement, for and, and it, it puts pressure on governments to invest in quantum tech centers. And, uh, and you know, this is how it starts, right? Initially, there's going to be frustration. You know, uh, quantum computers may not as wo work as well as they might, as well as uh, the expectation might be, but it's going to get resolved over time. So what we're doing is, is really a grassroots movement. Educate everyone, get, you know, uh, get them asking for quantum computers, and in parallel, get the whole technology going. Should I? Yeah. So I, I have a question, actually, for all of you. About 330 million Americans, give or take a few. Uh, how many US citizens do we produce uh, PhDs in quantum physics every year? Somebody throw a number out. How many do you think? How many? A couple thousand. Anyone else? Pardon? A hundred. On average, the US produces 48. 48 PhDs in quantum physics every year that are US citizens. When you begin to look at those numbers and think about what the implications of that are, everything that we're talking about becomes super important about making this technology such that people can engage with it at all levels of education and do meaningful things with it. We can't all be quantum physicists. We can't all be Google programmers. We have to think about ways of democratizing quantum that allow more people to engage with it. Because if we